Uh, keep standing with me a moment. We're going to partake of Holy Communion together. We want to welcome our other campuses. We're all going to take communion together to celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we welcome Baxter, Livingston, and Sparta. No matter who you, where you're tuning in from, we welcome you to our Easter services. And then we give a special welcome to all of our family in the correctional facilities. God bless you guys. We're so glad you're with us this Easter. But we're going to partake of Holy Communion. So if you'll get your communion set out, it should be there in the seat with you. And uh, the Bible says on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, was arrested, that he was with his friends. Many of us are with our friends here today. And the Bible tells us he took out a piece of unleavened bread and he held up that bread and he said, hey guys, I want you to know what this bread represents. It represents why I came from heaven to earth because my, this bread represents my body. And it's gonna be beaten and broke and spit upon and tormented and pierced with big nails. And he said, I did that because I absolutely love you. I didn't have to come, but you were worth it. And so every time you take this bread together, you're remembering what I did for you, how much I love you, and you're honoring me. And so it is my privilege for us to honor him today. So let's do that. Lord Jesus, thank you for your body that you willingly laid down. You allowed it to be beaten and broken and spit upon and mocked and pierced because of your love for us. And so today, Lord Jesus, we honor you and we thank you. Let's protect together. The Bible says after they ate the bread that he took the cup. He held the cup up and he said, I want you to know that this, this cup represents my blood. Now see, they understood the blood. Because see, both the Old Testament in the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant were both established as blood covenants. What's that mean? The blood made those covenants possible. Now, we don't really connect well with the Old Testament sacrifices because we don't live in that covenant. But basically, what they were realizing is the blood is required where there's been sin. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when man sinned, God killed an animal to clothe them, to, to, hide, to cover their shame and their nakedness. And so an animal, an innocent animal had to be sacrificed. And from then on out in the Old Covenant, you see where families who believe God and worship God would take a lamb and they would kill that lamb and the blood of that lamb, see, it didn't do anything about the sin issue. It just pushed their sin forward for a year, but it never removed sin. And Jesus held that cup up and said, I'm establishing a new covenant with better promises because the blood of the real lamb is here and it's not just going to push your sins forward. It's going to wash your sins away as if you never sin and you will be righteous with God just as I am. What a great, great Savior. Jesus, thank you for your precious blood, for your sacrifice. And so, Lord Jesus, we remember and honor you today as we partake of this cup. Let's partake together. Amen, amen. All of you can be seated. God bless you. Thank you to our worship team. Does our worship teams at every campus not do a great job? All of our worship teams at all of our campuses, we celebrate you and thank you. As you noticed here, we have a violinist with us this morning. Go ahead and wave at everybody. She's one of our girls. I worked with her for at least a month on that, didn't I? Don't lie in church. Anyway, I just love it, though. We have so many gifted people as a part of Life Church, and this young lady who was playing on the violin played at Carnegie Hall last month. And so I love, I love gifted, talented people who use their gifts for God. Amen? She played at Carnegie Hall, and last week I played at the pool hall. So anyway, I'm just kidding. I ain't played pool in a long time. It's so good to see you. God bless all of you for being here on this wonderful Easter weekend. Let me make a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to get into the message. But first of all, everybody say First Wednesday. So first Wednesday is something we've been doing in 2024. The first Wednesday of every month, we just come together in all of our campuses. Our programs and stuff are kind of put on hold. And we come together just to have a few minutes of worshiping the Lord and then the Word of God coming forth. 
And if you've been a part of the first three, they've been dynamic. Well, I want you to know we've got a special guest coming in this next Wednesday on April the 3rd, and you're not going to want to miss this dude. And who is he, Pastor Bob? I'm not going to tell you. You'll find out when he gets here. But I'm telling you, he, he is, God has used him all over the world. And uh, so uh, ab- a- April 3rd, this coming Wednesday, first Wednesday, make sure you get to one of our campuses to be a part of that. And then first Saturday prayer is April 6th. So next Saturday, what we've started also in 2024, the first Saturday of every month, we come in to one of our campuses. All of our campuses are doing that. Baxter comes up here with us. But all, all of our other campuses are doing this. And from 9 to about 9.45, we just come together on that Saturday morning at 9 a.m. to sing a couple worship songs and then to pray for a few minutes just to set our month off of, God, we want you to be with us. So next Saturday, April 6th, is first Saturday prayer meeting. And then if you'll do me a favor real quickly, everybody in the seat in front of you, there's, there's a card that says Life Church Survey. Will you please take that out? And before you're thinking, no, I'm not going to, we have cameras that are watching you, and we have a lot of law enforcement. They will arrest you in the parking lot if you do not do this. No, seriously, if you could please help us with this. This is really going to help us help you. This is really more for the people uh, so our eldership at this church can serve you better. And this is what this is for. We've never done this before. And you can do this on your phone if you want to. You can just hit this little code here and it'll bring it up. But if you don't want to do it on your phone, you can do it on this card. But this is, this is we've never done this, but we believe that this is important. So the first part says, please select your top three. I would like to hear messages on what the Bible says about blank. And you can check three of those. And we just want to minister to people where they're at. Everybody's different in their spiritual journey. And we just want to look at the scripture and help you with what God's stirring in your heart. So you can check three of those. And then the second part says, please select where you are in your relationship with Jesus. A, I am already in a relationship with Jesus. B, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus today. C, I am considering being a Christian. Or D, I don't plan on making a decision about relationship with Jesus at this time. And we want you to be honest about that. Just kind of where we can kind of locate where we're at and how we can pray for our church family. So if you'll, and just lay that card in the seat. If you do it on your phone, don't worry about it. That'd be great. But if you do it with this card, leave it in the seat as you leave, or you can, on your way out, the ushers will have buckets at the door. Just drop it in there, and that will help us. Uh, this is Dollar Club Weekend. If you've been a part of Life Church, you know what this is, but if you're new, you're visiting Life Church, let me explain Dollar Club to you real quickly. Dollar Club is, is different from our tithe and offering. What we do is we ask every person, every family across all of our campuses to put in an extra dollar. And what we do is at the end of the month, we take all those dollars and we find some kind of organization that's, that's doing something in the name of Jesus. Sometimes it's been a, a family in crisis that someone has turned their name in. They qualified for the dollar club. We've helped them. Sometimes it's churches. Well, this weekend is a special dollar club weekend because this is a special Sunday. This is Easter Sunday. And so Easter is all about sacrificial giving. God sacrificed to bring life to us. And so this year we wanted to do something special. And so watch this Dollar Club and I'll come back and we'll get into the message. Hello, Life Church. Happy Easter. It's Dollar Club weekend and we are excited. Uh, If you don't know what Dollar Club weekend is, this is where we ask everyone in the congregation just to give $1. You can reach in there, some coffee money, whatever you need. What we do is we put that all in a pot, then we look for people or organizations or families or maybe even churches that we could help within our community. Our pastor's heart this year was to bless some churches. So we set out to find 10 churches who we can partner with to bless them. We were able to give away $100,000 in money. Yes, 10 churches, $10,000 each. We got to walk in and just say, Pastor, here you go. We know the work you're doing in your community, and we just thank you for that. We truly believe that we are better together and that that money is to go further than what we could ever accomplish on our own. 
Thank you, Life Church, for being such a generous church. We could not do it without you. And remember, you don't give to Life Church, you give through Life Church. Happy Easter. I love that. I absolutely love that. So let me just share with you a little bit about this. Um, so for the last several Easter's, we came to realize as a leadership of this church that Easter is all about God giving his best. And so Easter for a church is usually the best, the most attendance, and also the biggest offering. And the Lord said, I want you to give it. I want you to give it away. See, if you're thinking, boy, that church has got more money than they know what to do with. No, we don't. We're going to fill that offering. How many know Jesus felt it when he gave his life? See, when you really give, you feel it. It's not chump change. So the first reason we want to do it is we want to act like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we want to give and show the love of Jesus Christ. And then this year, God just put it on my heart to bless some churches. And so I went to Bob Sotis, who is our outreach director, and I said, Bob, I want you to find us some churches that are, number one, not compromising the message of Jesus Christ. But secondly, they're not just focused on the people that come inside the four walls, but it's churches that are trying to make Jesus famous and touch lives outside of the walls of their church. So all 10 of those churches have outreach programs. They have feeding ministries or something like that. And so we were able to come in and say, you know what? We just wanted you to know this year that we love what you're doing and we love what you're doing for Jesus. And we just wanted to come in and partner with you on that. And so here's some seed money to help you. And what's, what's amazing, I had, past, I had a pastor to come in. He's in a neighboring county that drove all the way down here. So he's saying this to you, not just me. I give, but I didn't give $100,000. But he said, I just wanted you to know, I've never seen anything like this. I hope that the church can see more things like this. Here's why. Because Jesus said, the way people are going to know that I came is your love for one another. That you're not just focused on you. So that was a wonderful testimony. But then I had pastors, some of them got very emotional and said, you don't understand. This was a God moment for our church. We were at a critical crisis moment and this money came just in time. Don't you love it when God's just in time? And so praise the Lord. So I want to say to you, thank you, Life Church, for being a loving, giving people. I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be amongst you. And that we can be a part of a church that just says, we just want to do our part. It's not all about us. And so that being said, if you want to give in our offerings here at Life Church, you give to us, but you give through us, I promise you. But you can go to our website, livelife.church slash give and give there. Uh, you can give it on your way out in the offering buckets, or you can um, uh, go to our app, however you want to give. But we just say, God bless you. Thank you for giving and being a blessing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what this weekend represents. It represents that all victory and power is in your hands. And we just worship you, our resurrected king. Now, Lord, speak to us. Open our eyes, ears, and our hearts. We want to believe and receive what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've entitled this message, The Royal Flush. Now, before your mind gets carried away, I'm not talking about poker. Nor am I talking about an expensive toilet. What? I had a lady at one of our services last night. We had three services last night. And at the edge service, when I said, it's not an, I'm not talking about an expensive toilet, she's about on the third row, and she said, well, I didn't even think of a toilet. <laughs> Probably because she plays poker. But anyway, I said, well, my staff did. That's because they're always in the toilet. But anyway... Uh, no, let me talk to you about where this message came from. And let me set it up for you. You may not realize this, and then again, you might. But a lot of people have such a misconception of the message of Easter. I mean, totally miss it. 
They have a misconception and don't understand the message that Jesus came to earth to bring. Here's why I know that. Did you know most people, nearly everybody, I would say everybody, knows they need God? Even people who say, I don't believe in God, when they're by themselves or they're in their moment of crisis and nobody's around to hear them, they know they need God. But do you know why many, many, if not most people, never open themselves up to God? is because of a wrong message in their head. And here it is, and I'm going to prove it to you in this message. But here's why most people who know they need God still don't open themselves up to God. Here, here, here it is. I need God, and I want God to come in, but God cannot come in until I get this sin out of my life. There's more people deal with that than you can even imagine. You know why they're thinking that? Well, first of all, God's holy, I'm not, so I want him to come in, but until I get out this sin, he can't come in. That is not the message of Jesus Christ. If we could do that, he wouldn't have had to come in the first place, right? So the bottom line is the message of Jesus, here's the Easter message, let me in and I'll flush out the stronghold and sin out of your life, but you've got to let me in. Now, let me tell you why many of us in the Bible Belt struggle with this. What do I mean? The reason many of us, even in the church, struggle with, well, if I can get out this sin, more of him can come in, is because of the message that we heard growing up. Let me give you an example. I've had a lot of people nod their heads when I say this. We must have went to church together. But here's the message. Here it is. See if you've ever heard it. Get that sin out of your life. You ever heard that? Get that sin out of your life. Did it work? No, it didn't work. Why? Because we can't. It's impossible. Jesus' message is this. Get filled with me, and that'll set you free. That's his message. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. Here it is. Matthew 12, 29. For who, this is Jesus asking a question, For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even, everybody say stronger. Someone even stronger who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Let me interpret what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, when there's someone who has someone inside their house that's strong, you're going to need somebody stronger to come in before you can win and get that person out of that house. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about this. When, when we, and we've all done it, allowed Satan to influence and bring things into our life, those things become stronger than we ourselves are stronger, and our self-help books and our willpower won't do it. And so Jesus is saying, you're going to need somebody stronger to come in if you're going to win, and I'm the dude that can do it. Amen. Let me in, and I promise you'll win over that stronghold and that sin. That's the message of Christ. Right now, Actually, in America, it's always been here a little bit, but it's really just like blown up. And it's this. We're having a lot of problems, especially in the Atlanta, Georgia area. If you watch the news at all, you've seen it on the news, of squatters. Anybody seen that on the news? So let me explain what that is. It's when people have moved into an empty house. Most often, it's a rental property. And let me just say, a lot of people who are working, and the husband and wife, matter of fact, are working at jobs, they will, as they can accumulate some money, buy a rental property. You know why they buy that rental property? So subsidize their income when they can no longer physically work. It's part of their retirement. And so they'll go out and buy these properties, and and when they buy these properties, they lease them, them, or rent them then to bring in extra income for their retirement. But what's happening, especially in the Atlanta area, and all over the world, actually, is When someone has bought a rental home, if the people who rented that home move out, between the time they can get new tenants in, some of these squatters move in. And here's the thing. They move in illegally, but the issue becomes they can't, even though they own the property, they can't make them move out. It's against the law. And so if you own a rental property and these people move into your house, if you go in and physically remove them, you go to jail. Now, here's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 12. Get a hold of this. Because, see, here's the deal. 
You can eventually get those people out of that house, but here's how you do it. They can stay until they are legally convicted and evicted by the authorities. Did you know Satan can move into your life illegally? Because he's a thief and a robber, Jesus said. But you can't move him out. You're not strong enough. And so Jesus is saying, listen, if you'll allow my authority to come in, he will be convicted and evicted out of your life. But I am the authority. Are you listening to me? We have to have the authority of Jesus Christ. Notice this scripture, John 7, 37. Now, on the final and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried with a loud voice, if any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. You know who he's talking to right there? Everybody. Because everybody has a thirsty soul. Every one of us have a thirst in our soul we need quenched. And Jesus is saying, I'm the water boy. I'm the one that can quench the thirst of your soul. The world's wells will leave you thirsty, but I can quench your thirst. Now, notice this. For he, uh, he who comes to me and drink, he who believes in me and cleaves to and trusts and relies on me, no longer relies on your own self-help, but relies on me, as the scripture said, from his or hers innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. But he was speaking here of the Spirit whom those who believed, trusted in, and had faith in him were afterward to receive. For the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified or raised to honor. Another reason we celebrate Easter is because he has been raised to honor and the Holy Spirit is now available to whoever will drink. Now, here's what Jesus is saying there. If you'll let me in and you'll allow me to pour my spirit in, I will flush out that thing that's trying to win in your life. But you've got to let me pour my spirit in. But hang with me. But the key to stay free is to continually allow him to pour his spirit in. You can't just do that one time in 1979. It's our daily bread, Jesus said. He must daily pour his spirit into your life. Why? Here's why. Matthew 12, 43. So in 12, 29, he said, hey... Here's the message. There's a stronghold in your life. Satan's gained influence in your life. And you're not strong enough to get it out. If you'll let me in, I'll get it out. That's how you get free. But notice what he says in verse 43. When an evil spirit leaves a person, so when that thing by Jesus and his spirit is driven out, it goes into a desert seeking rest but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home. Everybody say empty. See, that's the problem. We're never supposed to be empty. Once he drives that out, we're supposed to be filled with the Spirit continually. Notice what happens if the Spirit that had you comes back and finds you empty. So he finds his former home empty, swept, and in order. Then the Spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. So let me just share with you this is so true. In my almost 30 years of full-time ministry, I can't tell you the times that I've seen this happen to people. They come through the doors of this church and their life is defeated. They're depressed. They're oppressed. They know they've turned everywhere else but Jesus. And they come in and they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I've had them sling snot everywhere. I mean, man, God has touched their soul. But then all of a sudden, they go missing and they're no longer a part of the church or God's people or things of God anywhere. And you know what happens when you find that person two years later? If they're still alive, they're worse off than before. Why? Because this book is true. Once he comes in, you got to let him continue to pour his spirit in. That's the message of Jesus. That's the message of Easter. So here it is. Let me sum it up for you. The message of Easter is this. If you've got something in your life that's robbing and stealing and killing your peace, your joy, the life God intended for you to have. Understand this. you got to stop trying and you start, got, you got to start relying on the inward work of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. And if you'll let him in, he'll use that water to flush out that stronghold, that sin. But you got to keep allowing him to pour himself in. Now, often when Jesus would teach a message, he would use an illustration. Because Jesus understood, we learn as much 
if not more, by what we see than not just what we hear. So I want to show you an illustration of what Jesus just talked about. Watch the screen, please. How's it going, Joe? You again. <laughs> Looking kind of down. I'm all right. I'm fine. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I saw you there. You know, hard to find your place in this world, isn't it? I'm doing okay. I think so, man. I mean, you, you're trying to fit in. You're trying to make friends, be accepted. Man, it's all anybody wants, right? But... Let's face it, Joe, you're, you're a square peg trying to fit in a round hole. Look, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> you know what the problem is? I can tell you what the problem is if you want to know. You want to know? What? We raised a church, right? Got all this church stuff going on? Yeah. Yeah, and they told you all the rules you got to live by, right? Do this. Don't do that. Be this way or you don't measure up. Come on, Joe, who wants to live like that? Certainly not everybody out here. They're all out here having a blast. And what are you doing? You're sitting in the back row watching the show. They're telling you that Jesus is the way, right? That's, that's right. It's not right, that's a lie. No, it's not. It's a lie, Joe. All they want to do is control you, man. That's all it's about, control. They want you to give up everything that makes you, you. Yeah, I mean, what does it say? He's the potter and you're the clay. He's going to smash you down and then he's going to build you back up into a new creature. Hey, I didn't say that. It's straight out of the book. Jesus just wants to own you, man. Now, look, you follow me. It's completely different. You can do what you want, when you want, however you want to do it. I don't care. I'm going to accept you for who you are. I'm fun. I'm freedom. You know what I'm saying? Look. No, no. Come on, man. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I just want you to try. Look. Just try. That's all I'm saying. If you don't like it, if you don't like it, you can go back to your safe, boring, lonely life, all right? No harm, no foul. But if you don't at least try it, well, man, you, you're, you're just not being true to yourself. You're not giving yourself your best opportunity for happiness. I'm telling you, come on, Joe. Dip your toes in the water, live a little, man. How you feeling? Pretty good, huh? No! No! Oh, come on, Joe. You can't quit on me now, man. You can't stop now. Look, we've just got started. Hey, Joe, come on, man. Everybody's looking. <laughs> you just got to trust me. I am going to take you to places you've never dreamed of. But you got to take them. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. You can do it. Yeah! Joe, 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 Joe! <laughs> Woo! <sighs> All right. <clears throat> Woo, these are heavy. No, <laughs> no! Uh, uh, no, you take them. You earned them, you take them. I, I don't want to hear it. I don't hear it. You want to play, you got to pay. Take them all. Put them in there. There you go, every one of them. <laughs> Last one, put it in there. How you feeling now, Joe? Not everything is cracked up to be, is it? Look at you. You know, you thought you had it all, you thought you were going to be accepted, but Where's those friends of yours? Yeah, they skipped out, right? As soon as you start having tough times, 
all by yourself, nowhere to go, all you got's me. <laughs> ah, Joe, you're a bad man. You're a loser, you know that? You're a loser. I ain't gonna lie. Oh, wait a minute. He's still got a lot of fight in him. He's still going for it. Come on, Joe, you can do it. All you need some self-control, man. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're finished, Joe. You're finished. You're nothing. Nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. The world would be a better place without you. He's mine now. Father, help me. He's a liar and a cheat and a thief. And I know that, but I, I'm not strong enough on my own to take these out of my life. I, I've tried, I can't do it by myself. I need you. Lord, help me. Hey, what's he doing here? What's he doing here? No, 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 no! Hey! Oh, look at you, that big, stupid grin on your face. I'm gonna wipe that off. You can't stop me. I will keep coming. I will... Think you've won? Think you've won? You haven't won, because I don't give up. I never give up. I will be here every day of your life. Jesus! Make him go away. No. No! I know that's just a little skit. Ha uh ha. -huh. Listen, that is the message of the gospel. That's it. Right there. See, that was me. Now, by the way, that's Pastor Robert, one of our children's pastors. <laughs> it scares me he makes such a good devil, honestly. <laughs> he is an attorney, so. <laughs> but no, why I wanted to show you that skit, that, that was my life you just watched. See, if you go out of this parking lot and turn right and go about three miles out here, that's where I grew up. A Baptist preacher's son. At 12 years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I mean, I knew Jesus had come into my life, but at 15 years old, that devil showed up. Not Robert in a red jacket. It was some ungodly friends who started convincing me how boring church was. Why would I? And I want you to know, Satan promised me in Bobby's life, the same thing you saw him promise Joe. You want to have a ball? You want to have a ball? Never knowing just a few years later, it'd be a ball and chain. See, it wasn't freedom he promised me that I, I would find. It wasn't freedom I found. I ended up bound by addiction and depression to the point of I wanted to die, but I was afraid to because I knew that there's a life after this one. That's a miserable place to be. When I go to speak at public venues that's got a lot of young people, I will share my testimony, but I usually won't share a lot about my drug addiction. I'd much more want to share about what Jesus wants to do in our lives, but to sometimes connect and let them know, man, it got bad for me, but I don't have to go very deep into all the details. All I have to say is this, and I'm telling you the truth when I say this, I tell the young people, listen, when your drug buddies and your drug dealer starts counseling you, you probably got a problem. That's the truth. They were saying, you're going to die. But here's the thing. I wanted to be free. It, it ceased to be fun. It became such a empty place in my life, and I wanted to get free I had a, my work even back then sent me to a 
very, very expensive treatment center. It didn't work. And it wasn't, here's what I got free, guys. What sets you free, Pastor Bob? When I quit trying and I started relying on Jesus to pour himself into my life, that's when I got free. When I quit trying to be my Savior and I let him to be my Savior. I want to share with you before we go one more story. Put that picture up there. Anybody know who this is? Corn. Yeah. So, Brian Welch. This man right here, many of you don't know who this is, but this man is worth millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. His, his fan base is a little bigger than Bobby Davis's. This is the picture of the people, crowds he plays to. This is him right over here, second from the right. <laughs> That's a special speaker we're going to have in. Uh, <laughs> No, I love this guy's story because he found himself exactly where Bobby Davis was before I let Jesus in. I want you to watch this story real quickly, and then we'll close this up. I saw, I saw somewhere in the movie where your parents said they didn't even, your mom said in hindsight 2020, she realized all the signs. But at the time, she didn't even know or they weren't even aware uh, that you were uh, that addicted to, to meth and on drugs. Right. I would play it off. I look successful. Yeah. You got probably a couple different types of addicts. It's the functioning addict and the non-functioning addict. It's just, you know, and I was a pretty high-functioning addict. I could do all kinds of things. And, and um, you know, I, I played my parts yeah. with the band. I was just socially recluse. Yeah. At some point, Brian, in the midst of all of this uh, crazy, what some people would uh, call a successful life, Somebody introduces you uh, to the message of Christ. Somebody introduces you to yeah. the Bible because you didn't grow up in it, right? No. Okay, so at what age or give us, you know, that experience. How, how, how did you have that encounter? Well, it was, I was the type of guy that, you know, um, would flip through the channels and be like, land on TBN or a Christian channel and be like, you know, and who knows what I said back then, right. but just, you know, mocked it or whatever. And then, you know, fast forward years and years later, um, I got to this point where I was on that two year binge, right? And I wanted to get clean. I had talked to a couple uh, um, outpatient rehab places, one in Bakersfield and one in Hollywood. And they both were telling me, we don't, we don't have as much success with meth addicts as we do with other drug addicts. And I'm just like going, wow. So what are you telling me? What can you do for me? And they're like, well, we can try, you know, I'm just, we just have to be honest with you and you can do it. You can, you know, if you, if you set your, but I wasn't given like a lot of hope, you know? And uh, so I was just thinking like, I gotta, cause by that time I was like, I, I do not want to exist anymore. Hmm. I'm, a, I'm a shell walking around with nothing of substance inside. And I got all kinds of money in the bank but I just don't want to wake up when I go to sleep. I just wish that I could just stay asleep. And, wow. you know, and the only thing that made me want to breathe and, and live was my daughter. So I'm thinking, I just need to get off the drugs and so I could just be the best person I could be for her. Mm -hmm. But then I would have the thoughts when I get back on the drugs or, or do another line and that would wear off, I would think, man, she'd better off without me. Mm. And I'd start going through the suicidal uh, the thoughts and everything. And so. So it was a tug of war, but um, I told you that I was a functioning drug addict. I had these partners that were um, doing real estate deals. They were buying land and developing, and I became a partner with them. And uh, money was like my thing. I never liked to spend it. I always liked to make it grow. That was my thing before. And so these guys were growing their money, and right. so I blended right with them. And so I was attracted to them, and their business through that, and they actually were Christians. Wow. So God was using my money <laughs> idol, if you will. Right. And so I- uh, Pulling you in. Yeah, and so I did a business deal with them. We bought some land, and, and they were, I was just, they, you could tell, man, I was on meth, you know? And anybody could tell something was a little off, you know? Right. And so they ended up just talking to me, and they invited me to go to church one day, and I'm like, you know, I, I used to mock it when I was growing up, and, uh, but I did ask Christ in my heart when I was 12 through some neighbors. But uh, so I held on to that, and when they asked me to come to church, I'm like, oh, 
you know, I always was thinking was like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, you know? And it's like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, they're not, they're not kind of like I am, but they're not the same type of person I am, but maybe they're probably sober. So if I go there, it'll be like a community of sober people. I okay. thought Christians just didn't party, you know, that's okay. what I thought. And then I get there and I hear about this, this Jesus Christ who's real, the son of God who was here and, you know, died on the cross and, and raised from the dead and came and uh, would come to live inside of me. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around. I'm like, so this guy came and walked on the earth in a robe and did miracles and then went on, died on the cross and then raised back to life and now he's gonna come live inside of me. I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> you know, and, uh, but you know, you could feel the presence and everything at that church, what they took me to. And I'm like, man, these people are either crazy or they have the meaning of life. And I started thinking back when I asked Christ in my heart and I'm like, maybe that was where my journey went the wrong way. Yeah. You know, maybe that's why, sure I got money and success and fame and every, everything, but I don't know who I am. Maybe that's where I, I went off track. Mm. And so I was just like, I raised my hand and I went home and I started praying to God like I had been a Christian for 20 years. I was wow. desperate. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. When you have this experience and when you have this re-encounter, if you will, with the Lord, uh, is it a gradual turnaround or is it an overnight uh, turnaround as far as your addiction and your lifestyle at that point? It was pretty overnight when I think about, you know, it was just a, a couple weeks, three weeks or something, but I did, I, man, the pastor was so cool there. He was, he just talked about, like, he was in jeans and a, a regular shirt. He didn't look like holier than thou. And he just said, look, man, you, if you're on drugs, if you're messed up, if you're, you have a, a bad marriage, you're alcoholic, you come, come to church while you're messed up. Yeah. Bring all your garbage here and, and God will come in and clean you out, yeah. you know? So he was, it was like non-judgmental, yeah. non-judgmental. And uh, so I kept going. What I wanted to point out to you, did you hear the message that set him free? The message that set him free was not, get that sin out of your life, because he'd been trying. He said, I went to a place and a man told me, come to Jesus just like you are. Bring all your mess because he's the Messiah. And he said, that pastor said, just let him in and he'll take care of that. You know what he's saying? Let him in, he'll flush out all that stronghold and sin. And that's exactly what happened. So let me tell you, I'm done. Let me tell you as I close on this. The main message of Life Church is exactly that message. Now, we talk about a lot of things at Life Church. We'll teach on marriage. We'll teach on prayer. We'll teach on uh, uh, overcoming fear. Why? Because the Bible talks about everything. But our main central message at Life Church is stop trying and start relying. You're not the Savior. He is. That's our main message. And, and the reason it is, is the first week I came to pastor this church, my very first week, it'll be 20 years ago this June, I was in town, I'd just taken this church, and I went into a place of business, and I saw an old buddy of mine that I used to do a lot of drinking and partying with, and he knew how bad I'd gotten. And he stopped me, and he said, hey, Bob. He said, hey, man. He said, I heard that you'd straightened your life out. I said, you heard wrong. He said, what? I said, I tried that and screwed it all up. I, I couldn't straighten my life out. But you know what I did, Ronnie? His name is Ronnie. I said, you know what I did? I let Jesus in. and Man, he began to clean it all out. And I've got more peace and more joy and, and more satisfaction in life than I've ever had in my life. I said, but it wasn't me. It was he came in and began to do a work in me I couldn't do. And I shared that with him. And then he got honest with me. And he said, Bobby, he said, alcohol has absolutely destroyed my life. He said, it cost me my marriage. It's about to cost me the fiance that I'm engaged to now. It's destroying me. He said, but after hearing you, he said, I'm going to do something. And now listen what people are saying. That's why I'm saying we got to bring this message. Here's what he said to me, guys. He said, 
Bobby, when I quit drinking, I'm coming to your church. What is he saying? When I can get out this sin, I'm going to let him in. When I quit drinking, I'm going to come to your church. You know what I told him? I said, Ronnie, that's the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard anybody say. He said, what do you mean? I said, that makes as much sense as you telling me, you know, I've got double pneumonia, and when I get rid of it, I'm going to go check out Cobra Regional and see what kind of hospital they are. <laughs> he said, you know what? That absolutely makes sense. And two weeks later, he was sitting right over here in this section. What's the message of Jesus? Quit trying and start relying. You quit being Savior and let him come in. Now, let me end with this. John 10.10 10 is why we named this church Life Church. Why? Because Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. How does Satan steal, kill, and destroy? Here's how he does it. He promises you and I life and other things other than Jesus Christ. And that thing ends up destroying us. That's how he does it. So I'll end with this. Most of you under the sound of my voice have never been a drug addict. And I thank God you haven't been because it's a miserable life. Amen. Many of you have never even touched a drug. Praise the Lord. But I can tell you, all of you, including me, you know what I can tell you about you? You're looking for a fix. Amen. Well, I, I, I ain't never done drugs. You're still, you're looking for a fix. Why would I say that? Here's why I say that. The reason I say we're all looking for a fix is because God created us. When he created mankind, different than the animals, when he created mankind, he created within a man a dependency. I call it he created within man an inner reliance. Why did God do that? He put on the inside of man this dependency, this inner reliance, so that that inner reliance would form an alliance with him, and it would cause us to connect to him. But what happens often is our inner reliance will form an alliance with something other than him, and it ends up leaving us devastated and depressed and oppressed. Are you listening to me, folks? Everybody's looking for a fix. It's just some aren't using drugs. Some do it with their job. Some do it with their money. Some stuff and stuff and stuff their life with stuff. But you know what? There's never enough stuff. So let me say this. With me, my inner reliance formed an alliance with drugs because of a sin that I got to become engaged in. But you know what I find with a lot of people? I know what I'm talking about. I've been doing this a long time. A lot of people form an... In form an alliance from their inner reliance, not because of a sin they've done, but because of a sin that's been done to them. What do I mean? When a person goes through hurt or pain, that's often when Satan will gain an entrance into their life. It's not their fault, but it becomes their problem. Why? Because often when we go through hurt or pain, our inner reliance can form an alliance, sometimes with drugs, but sometimes our inner reliance can form an alliance with depression, with oppression, with fear, with worry, with anxiety. Are you with me, folks? Here's why I know that. Hey, drugs are bad. So's depression. So's oppression. Anything that God hasn't designed for you to form an alliance with is bad. So you may never done drugs. Do you worry? You know, that's sin. The Bible says whatever not faith is sin. See, I'm going to get to you before I'm done here. And see, people back when I was doing drugs, you know what their counsel to me was? They, good people, not bad people. But you know what they'd tell me? Just quit. <laughs> you're killing yourself and you're embarrassing your family. Just quit. You know what I'd look back at them and say? Won't you quit gossiping? <laughs> How's that working for you? Seriously, why don't you quit worrying? Why don't you quit being depressed? How many found out it's just not so easy to quit? So don't focus on quitting, focus on getting Jesus. And when he comes in, that can't stay there. That's the message of the cross. 
So my message is this. We all need a royal flush. Jesus is the fix that we're all looking for. So quit trying to flesh it out. Let him flush it out. Let him come in. And I promise you that thing that, you know that thing that you say, I'm just not going to do that again. See, mine was drugs. I ain't doing that again. And I'll do it again. You, you got that in you right now? I'm not going to worry anymore. Okay, the pastor said today, pray and don't worry. So I'm not going to worry no more. And then two days later, you're worrying again. You're not a bad person. There's just something bad on the inside that Jesus don't want there. He wants to come in so you can win. Are you with me, everybody? Everybody, I'm, I'm finished. Close your, head, uh, close your eyes and bow your heads with me, please. <laughs> close your heads. <laughs> bow your heads and close your eyes. This is the sixth time I've done this this weekend. <laughs> Listen, I want to talk to your spirit a minute. You've been prayed over. Everybody in the sound of my voice, you've been prayed over. And we've asked God to open your heart, be sensitive to what he's saying to you. So I want to ask you this question before we go. Has your inner reliance formed an alliance with something other than who Jesus Christ is? If so, that inner reliance that's formed that alliance is not just a defiance toward God, but it's a defiance toward yourself. There's no freedom in that. And so if you know right now, yes, I don't want this thing dominating my life anymore. I truly want to be free of this. Then quit trying and start relying. Quit trying to flesh it out. Let him flush it out. And so if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, this is your perfect opportunity on this Easter weekend. But maybe you have accepted Christ, and like me at 12, and like Brian Welch at 12, I don't know what age it was, but you made that decision, but then you veered off. And your inner reliance started forming an alliance with something other than Christ, and it's left you pretty empty and not really full of life. If that's you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and we're going to talk to King Jesus, and we're going to ask him to come in and begin not finish, but begin pouring his spirit in and flushing out those things. But if that's you, and, that, and you're connecting with what Jesus is saying in this message, I want you to slip your hand up. That's me. That's me, Pastor. Amen. 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 I see you. Amen. Amen. Listen, wherever you're at, Jesus said, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, whoever calls on me, I will no wise reject. So I want every one of us to pray this together, and let's let's let King Jesus begin his work. Everybody pray this, please. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me, and I believe God raised you from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. Wash me with your blood. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my King. Jesus, come in. In Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate with all of you. Praise the Lord. Praise God.